This is Billy Kay, celebrating the life of R.B. Cunningham Graham. My original four-part series was made in homage to a man who was crucial in the founding of the two main political parties, Labour and the SNP, that would grace the new Scottish Parliament opened in 1999. My series was followed by a film about him in 2008, presented by writer Chris Dolan. He's still a huge fan. William Strine, the artist, used Robert Cunningham Graham as his model for Don Quixote. Now, I think the reason why I used him is because he was tall and thin and maybe a bit Spanishy looking. But maybe also because there is something fundamentally, I think, quixotic in a really good way about Cunningham Graham. There's that ability to reinvent and to see the world in very multifaceted, multicoloured ways. The international nationalist, the, the noble socialist, the writer come politician, the man who sees things, I think, kind of holistically and differently to everybody else. And he dreams a world in different ways. I just think some of his writing is more than just excellent writing. It has a quality to it where it recreates the world. Robert Cunningham Graham, as a writer and as a politician, had the ability to see beyond, to actually create almost in his head other ways of seeing the world. And that's how revolutionaries work, isn't it? In whatever sphere, they see it differently. And they only see it differently, but they work towards making it different in some very practical way. So I think the world people around about him saw, he just saw other possibilities. Mm -hmm. And he saw the universe in kind of a parallel way. And his image and his vision for a self-determined Scotland, for how Scotland can dream of itself differently, that there's another way of organising ourselves. And he's one of the first voices to actually make that an actual reality rather than just an idea. And he brings all this together. And it seems to me a kind of a spirit of Scotland, which is bigger than... I think one that's kind of done us down recently, you know, too much kind of naturalistic miserableism. There's this big, massive, magical spirit about it. And I always thought he was a kind of a kind of a mad genius. Now, the first programme in the Archive series from 1999, where the readers were John Buick and Paul Sampson. Don Roberto, the uncrowned King of Scots. Well, he was called the uncrowned king of Scotland. He was aristocratic in bearing. Of course, one of his ancestors had fought and died alongside William Wallace. He was proud of that uh, Scottish ancestry. It's also the case he is known as the modern Don Quixote because he was a bit like the Spanish hero who tilts at windmills. At least it was thought that was the case. Many people didn't see that his uh, policies were far-sighted. He was also stylish, flamboyant in appearance. When he walked into a room, he'd go to the mirror to fluff his hair up. There was an element of vanity there, a touch of the Spanish grandee who's performing the part. But uh, Chesterton said that Cunning and Graham achieved the adventure of being Cunning and Graham, and John Lavery said, I think I did something to help Graham in the creation of his masterpiece, himself. I think it's in some ways disgraceful that there hasn't been more attention paid to Cunning and Graham, but in our own day, we're seeing it happening. After all, the poet Hugh McDermott said that Cunning and Graham was like the great white stag of Scottish mythology, that when he appeared, good fortune also appeared. Rene McCohen and Cedric Watts, introducing us to the fabulous world of Robert Bonteen Cunningham Graham, who was born in London in 1852, died in Buenos Aires in 1936, and left a remarkable legacy to Scotland. A landowning aristocrat, he inherited Spanish blood and culture from his mother. In his day, he was called the last of the caballeros, a cowboy dandy, a modern conquistador. And according to his biographers, he was the sort of person about whom legends accumulate. He was mythogenic, an attractor and generator of legends. True, and that is part of his charm. But with him, the reality is every bit as compelling as the mythology. He was arguably the first socialist MP in Westminster, certainly first president of both the Scottish Labour Party and the National Party, forerunner of the SNP. And he influenced people dramatically. In the early 20s, he was introduced to Hugh McDermott. Later, the father of the Scottish literary renaissance confessed, my decision to make the Scottish cause cultural and political my life work 
dates from that moment. In the 70s, I had had done a film documentary on on Hugh McDermott. At the end of the film, which was called The Hammer and Thistle, uh, Chris Grieve, Hugh McDermott, pulled me into his beard and said, uh, you know, Murray, the film you should really make, it's Don Roberto, Cunningham Graham, he said, a real supporter of the workers' rights and a true aristocrat. He fits into a Scottish tradition of charismatic leaders. From a nationalist perspective, it's very important, the idea of the lost leader. In some ways, you could say it's almost a kind of quasi-Jacobite thing. Here is Don Roberto, who comes from over the seas uh, with aristocratic blood, to lead us to be a nation again. It's never explicitly mentioned, but it's obviously a very important theme. In the early days, when um, Graham was a liberal, uh, though really a socialist, a member of parliament, He realised with his voice and his manner and his extraordinary way that that you couldn't really advance all the inequalities in Scotland. And he wanted, as he said, to have a voice with the coal gravel, the dust in his voice. And that's why Keir Hardy was so important. And he really pushed, as you know, for Keir Hardy forward. I think it's very significant on the the Scottish Labour membership card. You have these two intaglio cameos. On the one hand, you have Keir Hardy, um, above which it says, no monopoly for the mines. And then the other side has this wonderful picture of Don Quixote or Don Roberto with his beard and his dandyish look, and it says on top of that, no privilege, the Scottish Labour Party. The filmmaker Murray Gregor and Richard Finlay of Strathclyde University. Cunningham Graham saw no barrier between politics and culture, a man very much in the Scottish tradition of democratic intellectualism. The surprise being that he only began writing seriously when he reached his early 40s. His travels and dual cultural heritage also stimulated him to be open to ideas, open to people. His friends and correspondents included Henry James, the distinguished novelist but also Buffalo Bill, Conrad, the great novelist but also Friedrich Engels Marx's collaborator, Keir Hardy, Ben Tillett, the great trade unionists, and Whistler, the artist, too. Mm -hmm. So his acquaintances, correspondents, make a most motley crew. If you put them in the same room together, they they would fight, I think. (laughs) Cedric Watts, co-author of the definitive critical biography of Graham. Here is the testimony of just one of those correspondents, Joseph Conrad on his friend Don Roberto. You, with your ideals of sincerity, courage and truth, are strangely out of place in this epoch of material preoccupation. Sometimes when I think of you here, quietly, you seem to me tragic with your courage, with your beliefs and your hopes. What don't you know? From the outside of a sail to the inside of a prison. When I think of you, I feel as though I had lived all my life in a dark hole without ever seeing or knowing anything. You have a fiendish gift of showing the futility the ghastly, jocular futility of life. In his lifetime, Cunningham Graham enjoyed a very high reputation. He was called a writer's writer. His writings were praised highly by Shaw, by Goldsworthy, by Ford Maddox Ford, by Frank Harris, by numerous figures. Now you can look at the praise and think, well, sometimes they were overrating the writings because they so loved and valued the personality of the man. Cunningham Graham was, in his day, a very distinctive writer. The distinctive qualities were the realism, the scepticism, the irony, the sense of the absurd, and always his sense of sympathy with the underdog. Many ordinary mortals, however, would stand in awe of the man and the life we are about to unfold. A life so removed from the mundane present that it's almost difficult to realise that there are people alive today who have memories of him as a real person in the 30s, from leading the Bannockburn rally on horseback to demonstrating his technique with the lasso before adoring children. Jean Polworth. He was my grandfather's elder brother, so he was my great-uncle, or grand-uncle, as we usually call it in Scotland. He uh, was my hero as well. I first met him, it was when I was about six, and we went to Ardoch, where he was living, and I remember this wonderful, lithe, tall chap with terrific sort of... uh, dramatic feel about him really but uh, with his beard and his lovely white hair and very kind eyes he had and i never forgotten because he came up to me and he said you are called Miss Cunningham Graham well he said you're the only girl so you're the only Miss Cunningham Graham so you'll be proud of it and I thought that was wonderful and then the next thing he did was he gave my brother a tip 
And I was quite used to my brother being given a tip by kind uncles and people, and I never got one. And to my absolute amazement, he gave me half a crown. He gave me the same amount he'd given my brother. And I thought that was very characteristic. He was, he was marvellous with children, dogs, and people, generally, really. He was a very, very humanitarian person. Joseph Conrad's younger son, John, told me once that when Cunningham Graham was due to visit the Conrad family, Joseph Conrad would say to John, go down the garden, climb that tall tree, and give me a shout when you see Don Roberto coming. And John said one day he climbed to the top of this tree and was looking out, and after a while a voice at his ear said, don't look down. And it was Cunningham Graham who'd taken a circuitous route and climbed the tree to surprise him. And Cunningham Graham was then in his 60s. Mm-hmm. And uh, another story was told by Boris Conrad, which was that uh, Cunningham Graham would uh, arrive and show Boris a silver revolver in a shoulder holster. They would go out into the garden and Boris would throw up apples while Don Roberto would blaze away at them. <laughs> and Boris loyally said, he never missed. I've got a few doubts. <laughs> And, of course, his house, you see, was an absolute revelation because it was full of all the things he'd picked up all over the world. And it was like an Aladdin's cave, Moroccan carpets and rugs and bits of silver gaucho horse gear and pictures of all our ancestors, which I found rather frightening at that age, but fascinating all the same. It was a vivid experience, and I think the rest of the family were very proud of him, although one occasionally got rude remarks from some of the people who didn't know him so well, because he did put people's backs up sometimes. But um, he could do no wrong in our eyes. We just thought he was a wonderful person. Another child, now the nonogenarian poet George Bruce, was able to get some of the energy Don Roberto emitted when his father took him and his younger brother on a special trip from Fraserborough to the art gallery in Aberdeen for the sole purpose of seeing the newly acquired Epstein bust of Cunningham Graham. It was perfectly clear this is a man of extraordinary character, even to a child. The way in which the the chin with the the beard jutted forth at you. The extraordinary sense of, well, I was going to say aristocracy, but that's happened to give a wrong impression. Aristos, aristocracy, thinking in terms rather of the Greek, a person of such consequence mentally and in character that whatever he did would be an outstanding thing. And I well remember wandering around with my father, and he then said, he's caught the character of the man entirely. It was kind of, I suppose, Epstein in this, that that kind of uh, roughness allows the energy to be there. And therefore, when my father went on to say, this man could do nearly everything, he could, he, he could ride horses and he could write stories. And he went on to expound, too, on Cunningham Graham's general view of society and how, above all, despite the fact that he was far away from Scotland many times, he always loved his native land and would find a means of expressing that love. That love for Scotland grew out of his family history. Graham's had fought for Wallace, Cunningham's had befriended Burns, and out of love for the beauty of his native district of Menteith, centred on his estates at Gartmoor. Kirsty Wishart of St Andrews University and Rennie McCohen. We're in Gartmore House, which was once home, of course, to Cunningham Graham, and we're looking over a landscape which has changed to some extent from his day and yet has not changed because we're on the high ground of what was once the fringe of the great Flanders moss and though modern conifer forestry has covered chunks of it, other parts are sites of special scientific interest and the old bog land is still there. And we're looking particularly to the Lake of Menteith and to Inchma Home and this is a very evocative view. We see the trees on the island quite clearly and the Menteith hills lying at the back and we're seeing some of the bog land in front. But this is frontier country between Highland and Lowland. Well did they call it by the name Menteith, the district of the moss. For moss invaded the whole strath, filling the space which once had been a sea with waves of heather and bog asphodel. Stretching from Mickelwood, it kissed the Clachnan Lung, Lapping the edges of the hills upon the north and south shores of the heathy sea, it put a peaty bridle on the forth. And from its depths, at the evening and at morn, rose a white vapour, which transformed it into a misty archipelago. 
upon whose waves the lonely steading rode, like the enchanted islands, which old mariners described, only to lose again into the fog at the first shift of wind. Birch trees and firs, reflected on the mirage of the mist, floated like parachutes, and heath and sky were joined together by the vapory pall which brooded on the moss. Billowing and boiling, as if some cauldron in the bowels of the earth was belching forth its steam. Fences were blotted out, roads disappeared, and from the moss strange noises rose, as forth lapped sullenly up against the banks where Polly Bagland stood. And it's also relating how we heal, um, relate the differences within Scotland to um, other cultures. He draws analogies between the Highlands and the Lowlands as being analogous to the situation between Spain and Portugal. I mean, if you look at something like his notes in the district of Menteith, which could be seen as being a very parochial work, but right from the very beginning, um, when he writes all rights reserved except in the Republic of Paraguay. You have him setting what could be seen as a purely regional work within a broader international context. He favours this mixture, but having favoured that mixture, before you know where you are, he's comparing what has happened to Gaelic with Arabic and Spanish. And so in this boiling pot of this man's mind, the fragmentation of life as we know it, the separation of life is not for him. But whatever story he takes, you will find that a point of reference which will extend, extend, and contains a whole world. Riding along the trail which runs skirting the foothills of the Atlas and forces us to dive occasionally into the deep dry nullah for there are only six or seven bridges in all Morocco and none near the Atlas, the vegetation changes. And again, we pass dwarf rhododendrons, arbutus and Kermes oak and enter into a zone of plants like that of southern Spain, with the exception that here the mignonette becomes a bush and common goldenrod grows four feet high with a thick woody stem. White poplars, walnuts, elms, and a variety of ash are planted round the houses. From the eaves hang strings of maize cobs. Beehives, like those the moors left in Spain, merely a hollow log of wood or a roll of cork lie in the gardens. Grapevines climb upon the trees, producing grapes long, rather hard, claret-coloured, and aromatic. The best, I think, in all the world, and which have fixed themselves upon the memory of my palate, as have the oranges of Paraguay. An extract from Mogreb El Aqsa, which I would rate as one of the finest travel books ever written. Within the family, oral tradition has it that the daring do and desire to light out for the frontier began at a very early age. Robert and younger brother Charlie, my grandfather, they went and they found a rowing boat on the Lake of Monteith, which was next door to Gartmore, and they managed to portage it up a little burn, and they got it eventually onto the River Forth, and they set off, well, I should think, on a very fast current, probably, going downstream from the Forth. Before they knew where they were, they were going under a bridge, and they were in Stirling, and the Forth was then getting bigger and bigger. And eventually, it was getting dark, and they couldn't do anything much about it. They probably lost one of their oars or something. And so they managed to get themselves into the bank, and they tied up, and they spent the night on the bank. Well, you can imagine the consternation of their parents, because they had no idea that they'd taken the boat off the lake, and they thought they were drowned. They thought they'd sunk at the bottom of the lake. But eventually, a policeman got hold of the family and uh, said they'd, that he'd just found these two naughty boys. He said... To, to their father, well, don't punish them, they've had a great adventure. <laughs> but the, the Lake of Monteith was very important in our family because the Grahams came from the Lake of Monteith. Inchmahome is a lovely island with the old priory on it, and uh, the boys used to have a wonderful time when they were small, playing hide-and-seek and 
rowing to and fro between the island and, and the shore. On Inch my home, my guides were Rennie McCohen and Norman Douglas. The games, they were created Earls of Monteith by James I. That would be 1425 because James I was in captivity in England for the first 20 years of his life. When he came north with his English bride, Joan Beaufort, he created Malise Graham, the first Graham Earl of Monteith. And this is all the descendants from that part of the family. What I think is wonderful here, you see the Earl and the Countess in stone with the little dogs at their feet with their arms round one another. The family always argued that they were descended indirectly from Scottish kings, and that was one of the most interesting things about him, wasn't he? He would have this Aristo and the descendant of kings who became the campaigner for the ordinary man. He became a bit depressed at times, it shows it in his writings, because he felt that the old Scotland was changing. And in this area in Teeth where we are now, Scots language was going. Gaelic had gone and is only left now in the place names. There were fewer worthies and characters from the past, and he felt that a general Scottishness was going. Now, he was right, and to some extent, Scots language has become diluted. Gaelic has gone. But he would be pleased, looking back from whatever Valhalla he's in now, to appreciate that Scottishness has not gone and that the causes that he argued for, including the Scots Parliament, are in fact vibrant in our own day. Cunningham Graham made us aware of the wealth within our Scottish traditions and all his writing has the conviction derived from first-hand experience. Even as a child, not all of it pleasant. His father, who had suffered a blow to his head as a young army officer in Ireland, became increasingly violent and depressive and was moved away to Dumfriesshire, far from the family estates, but in Robert's train route home from his school at Harrow. Of course, Uncle Robert had this marvellous knack of turning all his experiences into stories, and he did say once, nobody need ever write a book a biography of me, because everything I've ever done is in my stories. And the most famous story he ever wrote, which a lot of people know about, was called Beatuk for Moffat. And that links up with his father's illness, because he used to go and visit him at this rather remote house in Dumfriesshire quite often. He was very fond of his father. And I'm quite certain that what he'd, in fact had happened was he'd gone on a train journey from London and must have witnessed a similar situation of somebody coming up from London who was obviously terribly ill. Andra is Dean, and his brother Jock, the shepherd, tries to keep him going in the long journey north in the despairing hope that he'll hear his last wish granted to see his native hills again. The death dews gathered on his forehead as the train shot by Nethercleuch past Wamfrey and Dinwoodie, and with a jerk pulled up at Beatick, just at the summit of the pass. And so, in the cold spring morning light, the fine rain beating on the platform as the wife and brother got their almost speechless care out of the carriage, the brother whispered, Damned, you've done it, Andre. Here's Beatick. I'll tuck ye east to Muffet yet to dee. But on the platform, huddled on the bench to which he'd been brought, Andras sat speechless and dying in the rain. The doors banged too, the guard stepping in lightly as the train flew past, and a belated porter shouted, Bidek! Bidek for Muffet! And then, summoning his last strength, Andrus smiled and whispered faintly in his brother's ear, I, Bidek, for Muffet. Then his head fell back, and a faint bloody foam oozed from his pallid lips. His wife stood crying helplessly, the rain beating upon the flowers of her cheap hat, rendering it shapeless and ridiculous. But Jock, drawing out a bottle, took a short dram, and saying, Andra man, you made a recht good fecht of it, snorted an instant in a red pocket handkerchief, and calling up a boy said, Ring Jimmy to the tune, and tell McNichol to send up and fetch a corp. Then, after helping to remove the body to the waiting room, walked out into the rain and whistling corn ricks quietly between his teeth 
lit up his pipe and muttered as he smoked, A recht ged fecht, man I. Oh, I a game you under a pair fella. Weel, weel. You'll hear Bra Harl anyway in the new Moffat hairs. The end of Andra and Bituk for Moffat. The illness of his father and his ruinous inability to run the estates precipitated a family financial crisis, which led Robert into a world removed somewhat from Gartmoor and Harrow. I'll leave you with Jean Polworth and her son, the novelist James Johnsey, on how the adventure of being Cunningham Graham really began. He didn't, in fact, enjoy being at Harrow at all. And luckily for him, his parents couldn't afford to keep him there, so he was sent to the consular chaplain in Brussels, who ran a little school. And by the time he was 16, he, he went out there, and he learned fencing and all sorts of things, and Spanish and French. But he was longing to get travelling. His mother realised this, and also she knew they'd had to let Gartmore because of his father's ill health and they couldn't afford to live there. And she was terribly worried about what was going to happen to this boy when he grew up, because he had no estate to run, which is what they thought he was going to do. And she was talking to her great friend, who was Lady Early. They'd known each other as girls. And Lady Early said, well, some Ogilvy cousins of ours have an estancia in Argentina. Do you think he'd like to go out there and he could learn about cattle? And obviously his mother just jumped for joy. She thought that is exactly what he'd like to do. And so he was ready for an adventure. I mean, he was a bold young man, so I mean, he had done adventurous things within the context of a sort of Scottish upbringing. Age 17, he found himself on a boat for Argentina and suddenly he was plunged into this world of wild gauchos, huge plains, wild cattle and horses, jaguars in the forests, dodgy business partners, drinking knives. I mean, it must have been absolutely astounding for him. It certainly stirred his sense of adventure. I mean, within a few weeks of arriving there, he discovered the two Scotsmen that he'd gone out to be the third partner with were hopeless alcoholics, and their estancia was sort of collapsing around their ears. He couldn't stand it any longer, so he took off on his own with some cattle drovers. And within a few days of leaving with them, he found himself being swept up by a passing revolutionary army. <laughs> a conscript into this army. So life was pretty exciting for him, I think, from the start.